Welcome back all, it's MRO here. It's our final, I swear to you, it's our final episode in her series on early medieval England. We've covered the better part of 500 years and we've been given an overview of the main historical points and figures and some we don't talk about enough. We're starting right at the beginning of the 10th century after King Alfred the Great dies. All Alfred's hard work to restabilize his kingdom brought about another small golden age. This is a period some scholars refer to as the period of Benedictine reform. When Old English lit flourished as there was vernacular literacy and also a renewed focus on Latin. This Benedictine reform's foundations were laid by Alfred's grandson Athelstan. This was also a time when monks were pushing for people to behave more like monks. Brother Friar, you would not strike a fellow man of the cloth. No, no, I wouldn't. In fact, I'll help you pack for your journey. Uh-huh. You're going to need lots of gold to help you on your way to... Uh-huh. You're very rich! Uh-huh. 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 Enough! Uh-huh. Here's 30 pieces of silver to pay the devil on your way to hell! Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, this period of reform began under the reign of Athelstan, who was able to unite all of the seven kingdoms. Thus, we finally have England as England. All this talk about a nearly 700 year period being called the Anglo-Saxon period is rather odd when you think of how the term was only used within a 73 year period, mostly by kings as a propaganda tool. We'll discuss the term in more detail on its own, but as an aside, this short period between Alfred and Athelstan is when the term really flourished and then it disappeared for the most part for about 500 years and only resurfaced again during the age of colonization. So we have hundreds of years before when the term is not used to describe the various peoples and separate kingdoms and then it's used for 73 years and then not used again for another 500 years. People's romantic view of this period makes them think of Alfred and Athelstan. And there's this desire to build some sort of mythical past, to reflect on it which has been used for ethno-nationalist reasons. Think about the reasons why this infrequent use of the term, which was mostly in charters and never in the first person singular, as an identity marker, is used to describe a nearly 700 year span of time. Now what it is, is it's the part of the depopulation and a lot of people don't understand what that means and what there is is there's an end game it's called depopulation of the caucasian race or the anglo-saxon and that's what the goal is is to depopulate the anglo-saxon race because they are the ones with the strongest bloodlines and we'll leave it at that because then we get into a whole different topic but It's a depopulation of race. This kind of behavior then endorses less procreation. All right, so the less procreation, the less white people or, you know, Anglo-Saxon, let's say Anglo-Saxon because when I say white, all, all the Antifa guys call up the race card. So we're going to call ourselves Anglo-Saxon. Okay, where did we leave off? Alfred dies in 899. His son Edward the Elder takes over the Kingdom of Wessex, and immediately there's a family feud. Edward's cousin, Athelwold of Wessex, is like, Yo, cuz, my dad was older than your dad. This throne belongs to me. I'm king here. You get me? What's that? Athelwold also allied with some Vikings, so that was awkward for Edward the Elder. He ended up dying at the Battle of Holm in 902, so his son Ethelston could breathe a sigh of relief. Edward's sister Ethelfled, Lady of the Mercians, allied with her brother, 
which was also a relief not to have a sibling rivalry in this family drama. Brother and sister, with the help of her husband, Ethelred, just stay with me. I know all these names are confusing. They conquer the Danish territories in East Mercia and East Anglia. Remember, there was a Danish area called Jorvik. Ethelstan arranged for his, his sister to marry the Danish king, Citric, who ruled the Danish area on Britain. This marriage meant that the two kings agreed not to invade each other's territories or to support other enemies. Within a year, though, Citric dies and Ethelstan is like, well, time to invade. So the Danes in York submitted to Ethelstan. Next thing, Ethelstan's sister dies. And Mercia is swallowed up by Wessex. It wasn't by chance, though, because according to Edward, remember that's Ethelstan's dad and the son of Alfred the Great, had intended to keep the realms divided. But Edward's oldest son, Alfred, was supposed to have the throne, but he died 16 days after his dad. Damn, our boy Athelstan has some Grim Reaper vibes. Everyone who had their eye on him or his throne were handed a death note. No wonder he was so interested in having people write things down during his reign. Really makes you think. So here's some tea. We don't know who Edward's baby mama is. What? Athelstan's mother might have been one of Eddie's mistresses, but nobody said anything to contest Athelstan's crowning, so he became king. Scholars were worked up about this for a long time. I can link to their works if you're interested in whatever gossip they were debating. So Athelstan won a bunch of battles, he was bringing in money, and things were looking good. He increased production of charters, hence why there are so many of these and legal texts that survived from the 10th century in pre-conquest England. He summoned leading figures to his council. A council was called a Witten, and was concerned about social order. Athelstan arranged marriages for several of his sisters to continental rulers, so he had a keen eye on European politics. Smart move, my man. Okay, so Athelstan won a bunch of campaigns that were immortalized in literature. One of those battles is the Battle of Brunenburg. It's famous for being reported in the Annals of Ulster. Scholars disagree about the significance of this battle, but I love military history, so we'll spend a day talking about battles another day. What's important here is that Athelstan made some sort of pact with the Grim Reaper. He helped usher in the age of Benedictine reform. He revived scholarship and learning. He wrote down a bunch of laws. He provided some political and geographical stability by making connections on continental Europe. And he was king of England. All of it. So moving through the 10th century, Athelstan somehow pisses off the Grim Reaper finally, and he dies to <laughs> His half-brother Edmund becomes king and inherits strong continental contacts, which he maintains. He carries on the Wessex dynasty name. Historians seem to have a love or hate relationship with him for some reason. I'll link to some of their work and additional reading if you want. I think it might be something to do with the fact that our 2020 hindsight allows us to see that England had become a real force under Ethelstan and was on a trajectory to really establish itself on the European stage. But Edmund and his successors like Edgar couldn't maintain peace. Britons, along with Danish and Norse settlers in the Dane law, as well as others, disliked being ruled by Wessex. So there were rebellions, particularly in Northumbria. So remember how Viking attacks had waned over the last century and we thought that that was the end of that? Well, surprise! I mean, surprise attack! There was so much disorder among successions of kings and assassinations by the last quarter of the 10th century that that really opened the floodgates, or water gates, for Vikings who clearly smelled the chaos from miles away. In comes Ethelred as king of the English in 978. He was given the moniker the Unready, which some people mistake as meaning he wasn't ready. But the Old English word for unread means poorly counseled or poorly advised. Just throw a couple bombs up there, you'll be all right. Okay. Ah! 
He's known for being kind of a loser, really. And he really damaged England forever. But I think he gets a bad rap. Well, I wrote this song for the Christian youth. I want to teach kids the Christian truth. If you want to reach those kids on the street, then you got to do a rap to a hip-hop beat. So I gave my sermon an urban kick. My rhymes are fly, my beats are sick. My crew is big and it keeps getting bigger. That's because Jesus Christ is my... Oh, hell no. Not that kind of rap. He's blamed for the Norman Conquest, but he was handed the country when it was at its lowest through another series of Viking raids. He was being ill-advised because a number of counselors had their own interests at heart above the king's reputation when he was younger. And he really screwed up the massacre in the year 1002 that was nothing short of ethnic cleansing. Yeah, okay, he definitely wasn't great. But there were a few good things that he did that we should consider. He created the 12-person system of judging that was the origins of the modern jury system. And if we also consider that a lot of the surviving poetry and literature that has survived from pre-conquest England was compiled and preserved, if not also written during the late 10th century, that means he was doing what he could to encourage literary production still. Things hadn't fallen apart monastically and in scholarship as they did during Alfred's reign. So Alfred did some good. Maybe he should be called Athelred the Mediocre. In 991, there's another famous battle immortalized in a poem called the Battle of Malden. The poem describes loyalty and honor along with some blood and guts and bad decisions. We'll cover that in detail another day too. It's a really good piece. So just know for now that the English lost the battle, sorry, spoiler alert, who had sacked Ipswich. And then that sent a message that the Vikings could raid whenever they pleased. England was like, I am tired. This was a turning point for England. So wave after wave of attack is just depleting English morale. And at the Battle of Malden, the Danes demand the English pay a ransom. But the English commander, Britnoth, refuses. There was actually a small land bridge that gave the English the advantage, so the Norwegian commander Olaf, who was most likely Olaf Tryggvason, was like, This is a stick-up. Give me your money. All right, this is a stick-up. Touch them buzzers and we start blasting. Britnoth replies with, Just bring it, bitch! Oh my god! Oh my god, you got Has a rock got a death wish? What do you mean? We will pay you with spear tips and sword blades. Olaf is surprised as hell, and then he goes, well, let us pass over the land bridge that is clearly guarded because it won't be a fair fight otherwise. So instead of saying, no, bitch, stay there and we'll beat your ass, Britnoth says, come on down! <laughs> and then they quickly lost the battle. Britnoth is described in the Old English poem as Ophermode, which some scholars have debated whether it means having too much heart or courage, or just being too proud and reckless. So Ethelred was maybe hiding or something, because he's not around. And he's like, oh damn, I can't let this happen again. And the next time the Viking raids, it's not just to settle, it's to loot. Ethelred starts paying off the Vikings in a payment called Danegeld, or more specifically, it was called Gaffel, before the Norman Conquest. Where did this money come from? Taxes! <laughs> taxes! Beautiful, lovely taxes! <laughs> taxes. Yep, in order to make those tribute payments to Vikings, Ethelred had to find that money somewhere. And since money doesn't grow on trees, he had to get it somewhere. He also set up a sophisticated way of controlling currency, where coins in circulation ceased to be legal tender after five or six years, so that would help him raise large sums of money. So a peace treaty was drawn up intended to stop raids, but Dengeld or Gaffel payments only encouraged more Viking raids. Meanwhile, the Normans in the south are happy to watch the Danes raid the English coast. 
by this stage, Ethelred was ugh. So he seeks a treaty with the Normans, marries the daughter of a Norman duke, her name was Emma, and hopes that this will stop the raids. In the back of his mind though, Ethelred is still angry at the Danes for years of stealing money. And his own people are angry at him because taxes and instability and all that. There's a growing resentment in the country, not just at Ethelred, but at the Danes. The Danes at the time had not just raided, but some had become traitors or had settled or intermarried with the English populations. In late 1002, Ethelred is becoming paranoid that one day one of those Danes or half Danes or mixed Danes is going to kill him. So he's given them all the stink eye. On November 13th, 1002, there was a saint's feast day, St. Bryce, who was a 5th century martyr. This was supposed to be a celebration, but on that day, Ethelred ordered the killing of all Danes in the country, including under Dane law. Historians believe a lot of lives were lost on that day, but there's no specific number. As late as 2008, skeletal remains of 30 young men were found in an excavation in Oxford, suggesting that they may have been some of his victims. So this shocking attempt at ethnic cleansing is referred to as the St. Bryce Day Massacre. Okay, maybe Ethelred wasn't just mediocre. That moniker isn't right for him either. Perhaps Athelred the shithead is better. So I tried to rehabilitate Athelred, but I cannot. He made the Danes abroad quite upset. Within a decade, Sven Forkbeard brought a Danish fleet to Sandwich, Samage, Sandwich, Kent. He went to the Dane law up north, struck a deal with locals, and Ethelred was like, it's not safe. So that forced Ethelred into exile in Normandy. Sven was like, I'm king now. But he died a year later in 1014. So Ethelred was like, it's safe, and returned and drove Sven's son, Knut, back to Denmark. In the meantime, Ethelred had family drama again with his son Edmund, Knut returns and has the support of some English leaders. Ethelred is like, my son is annoying and I got no time for war. So he retreats to London and before anything else can happen, he dies. <laughs> His son Edmund replaces him. He raises an army that temporarily holds off the Danes, but at the Battle of Ashingdon, the Danes win. Edmund and Knut split the kingdom into two with Edmund ruling the West, Wessex, and Knut the rest. In 1017, Edmund dies mysteriously, probably by Knut or his supporters, and Knut is declared king of all of England. Remember Emma? She was the daughter of a Norman duke who married Ethelred. I'm sure anyone familiar with Game of Thrones can understand how complicated all these names and family feuds are. Think of that except real history. Well, she decided to marry Knut too. Her sons with Ethelred were either murdered or unsuccessful in taking the throne, so she supported her son by Knut to succeed the throne. She ended up fleeing to Bruges because her husband Knut had a child with another woman named Alf Gifu. This son was named Harold Harefoot. So Harold takes the throne when his dad dies, and then Harold dies shortly after, and then his half-brother, Emma's son, Hartha Knut, is king, and then he's so bad at kinging because he immediately raises taxes at Edward, remember Edward? Okay, Edward is Ethelred and Emma's son, who unsuccessfully tried to take the throne from Canute, and he had fled to Normandy. So he's called back from Normandy, and he becomes king. There's a powerful earl named Godwin of Wessex who supports Edward, and he thinks that giving Edward his daughter, who will secure his line, will have the throne eventually. Before Edward had even left Normandy, he had this friend named William, Duke of Normandy, who he had promised he would give the throne to just as jokes, you know. But they were like, ha ha ha, that'll never happen. So Edward is king, but he has no kids, and then he dies on January 5th, 1066. 
We'll go over all of this in detail in our military history series later on, but what happens is that Godwin's son, Harold, declares himself king because Edward is married to his sister and that there are no direct heirs. But in the south, William, Edward's old friend, hears news that Edward is dead and he's like, hang on, I guess the throne is mine. And then Knut's people in Norway, who had a pact with the king of Denmark, which was Knut's son, hear news of the king's death and Harold Hardrada of Norway says, I guess the throne is mine. So now King Harold Godwin's son has his estranged brother Tostig to deal with in England. Tostig ends up trying to enlist William of Normandy and William is like, nah, I'm good. So Tostig joins up with Harold Hardrada of Norway and is like, you got this, babe. And then they try to defeat his brother, the King of England, Harold Godwinson. King Harold forces battle near York in a battle called the Battle of Fulford. And we can talk about this in more detail another day because it's known as one of the bloodiest battles of the Middle Ages. So Harold hears the good news about the Battle of Fulford and he catches Hardrada by surprise after the previous battle, and he beats the Norwegian. King Harold remains king and allows survivors to get lost on 20 ships. So in between all that, William is eyeing England. The late summer had brought some bad weather, so he couldn't sail north to England, so he waited, but while Harold was celebrating his victories, William brings a fleet to England to invade. Harold's men are tired, and they needed rest and supplies, but upon hearing about William marching into London, Harold didn't let his men rest. On October 14, 1066, the Battle of Hastings occurred. The English held off the Normans with their famous Saxon wedge and their tight formation. Plus they were on higher ground, but something happened, and William called his cavalry back down, which looked like they were retreating. It would have been difficult for horses to climb given their position below, but at any rate, the English thought that the Normans were retreating, so they broke formation and started to come down. The Normans quickly seized this opportunity, turned around, and slaughtered the English. In this battle, King Harold was fatally wounded, and guess what? William took the English crown. And that was the closing of the early medieval English period. William of Normandy was crowned King of England and that ushered in a new age of culture, art, peoples, and whatever else to the land. It didn't come easy at first. William took another 10 years to consolidate his kingdom and he did so ruthlessly against all opposition. In the end, the cultural trajectory of England was changed for good. And it is this pre-conquest England that became romanticized as pure Englishness, when that, as we've talked about, was never pure to begin with. Over the next century, the Old English language didn't just disappear. Neither did the people. Some English earls and others became mercenaries abroad. Some joined the Varangian Guard. Others remained and were absorbed into the general population. An influx of Normans saw an eventual shift in language. Whereas the court was speaking French, the language on the streets for the next hundred years or so was Old English. By 1200, nearly all the English cathedrals and abbeys of note had been demolished or replaced with Norman-style architecture. And that, my homies, ends our four-part Back to Early Medieval England series. I managed to cram nearly 700 years into a couple of hours just for you, which is really a rudimentary summary but this is generally what a first year history course in this area would be like, except you wouldn't get gifts and memes and video clips and songs, and you most likely wouldn't get the critical thinking part because it's mostly just regurgitating without giving you all ways of thinking about the world and how we view it. 
Anyway, we'll do a summary of the term Anglo-Saxon next week, which will be a two-parter, and then we can move on to some English lit, where we'll focus on some Old English poetry before returning to a series on military history and more fun. For now, be blessed, be loved, unless you're a racist, and then you can go to hell. Bye! Fun, baby. Peace.